Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good, good to morning. see you. My daughter tells me that there's not enough room to park in the parking lot. I don't know how that could be. All of our pews are not filled up, but the parking lot is. So maybe we got a carpool, so we've got extra room and more people can come. In the snow did exactly. Well, well, praise the Lord. It's good to be here again and to, to be able to bring God's word before you. It's funny because Scott sends me a text message in the morning. Goes, I'm really interested to see what you're going to do with Acts chapter 16 verses 1 to 5. So the wonderful thing about preaching expositionally is that we get to cover all of God's word, no matter how easy or how hard it might be for the pastor. But I think I've come up with an idea here, looking at this portion of scripture. Uh, I don't know if all of you have ever gone through soul winning classes, ever been taught to evangelize. Uh, I went through evangelism explosion years ago, and we, we, we spent a whole week just learning how we might be able to soul win and, and preach the gospel. And we learned the two question test and, and, and we said, and we practiced with each other. Uh, we asked each other the two question test and, and then they'd send you out and they'd send you with an experienced soul winner to teach you how to win souls. And I think at the, at the base of our portion of scripture here, we're going to really get an idea of what soul winning is all about. Uh, anything you do, you want to look to someone who does a good job at it, right? If you're going to want to learn how to uh, catch fish, you better go to, with someone who's been an experienced fisherman. Scott will be able to help you out. John, we got a lot of experienced fishermen. Uh, if you want to play baseball, you know, you're going to want to play with someone who knows what they're doing. This week I was working with my grandsons. I got to babysit and I showed them how to play basketball and do a chest pass and a bounce pass. And, and I kind of demonstrate, you do it like this, hold it like this and, and do it this way. How do we win souls? You, you learn by watching others. So in our portion of scripture today, I see that soul winning is self-sacrificing. If you're going to be a soul winner, you need to be self-sacrificing. Timothy is at the base of our portion of scripture today, and he's going to be a lesson in soul winning. But of course, in any, any scriptural text, anything that we want to learn biblically, where do we learn it mostly from? The greatest example we ever had, and still have, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is and was the expert soul winner. So what I want to do, let, let's, you don't have to stand. Uh, I just want to read this portion of scripture, and I want to see three points as we get into it. Jesus is the greatest soul winner, our example. Timothy, soul winning put into practice. And then the goal of soul winning. So if you just look with me, just where you're seated there, Acts chapter 16, I'm going to just read verses 1 through 5. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in numbers daily. And so first and foremost, I want to look at the greatest soul winner to ever live. And some of the lessons we can learn from Jesus as the great soul winner. He went. Like any good soul winner, you've got to leave the comfort of your home. You've got to get up outside your comfort zone. He left heaven in which he had a perfect relationship with the triune God. A relationship of love and, 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 and everything is glorious and there's great harmony within the triune God. We read right in John chapter 1 to 4, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Things couldn't get any better. God wasn't only at harmony with himself, but God had created the sun, the moon, the stars, the grass, the trees, the woods, 
plethora of animals, the elephants, the zebra, the hyena, the horse, the cow, the chicken. God was not only in harmony with himself, but he had created something grand and wonderful. And then on that final day, he created man. And he created man in his own image. Everything was great. He even took a day off, time to take Sunday off and rest and just bask in all of his wonder. Everything was good. Everything was very good. Until, man, we have a way of messing up the most wonderful things. Adam and Eve fell into sin, and everything was upside down. Barely did the pages of Genesis begin, and Adam and Eve are in the soup. One son killing another son. Everything's a downward spiral from that. Man is lost and in need of soul winning. They need a savior, but who should we send? Who will go? Who will be that soul winner? Jesus as the perfect example of what it takes to save and to be there when folks are lost, God sent his very best. If I were him, I'd try to figure out another way. There's got to be another way to save these knuckleheads. But not God. God sends his own dear son. Doesn't only send him, but Jesus takes upon himself the very image and likeness of fallen man. The single greatest act of humility was God the Son incarnate. God the Son coming to deliver us from our own sins. To be, as it were, that tremendous soul winner. He comes humbly and obediently to serve. He's born like any other man, but a man of humble means. Born just a simple carpenter growing up in the small town of Nazareth. Nothing special. Nothing in him that would make you think he's something to be uh, wondered at. But oh, he was. Something very much to be wondered at. He grows up like any other little boy, but he grows up quite different from Adam and all the other little boys after that. He lives this perfectly wonderful, sinless life. He get, he's tempted just like Adam, but Adam, he's tempted in a beautiful garden paradise. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, in a desert for 40 days. He's tempted in every way like us, yet something much different. He's without sin. The fact is that Jesus is literally holier than thou, but he humbly comes to present himself, to become that one that would lead us, that would deliver us, lost, desperate sinners. He came and he preached the gospel of love. He got close to the dregs of life. It wasn't enough that Jesus was born a man like you and me, or the life that he lived, but he went right to the lost, the, the, the worst of the worst. I think about that story when he brought Matthew into the kingdom. Matthew was a tax collector, the lowest of the low, stealing from his own people. And Jesus comes and delivers him. And, and that wasn't enough. Jesus goes to Matthew's house, and they have a big party. And guess what? A lot of other wretched sinners show up. A lot of the dregs of life. Folks that other folks wouldn't hang out with. Certainly not the scribes and the Pharisees. They thought they had finally caught Jesus. What's he doing? Mark 2, 16 to 17 says, And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. This is the example of a soul winner. God coming in the person of his son and being with the, with the very worst of the worst. See, it's funny, those Pharisees didn't think they needed any help. They were the real ones to, to, be, to be sad for. But Jesus was right in the midst of the most wretched sinners. 
I think about that story where they think they're going to trip him up that one time in John and they drag that woman caught in the very act of adultery before Jesus and he starts to write in the sand, right? And they're holding, they're expecting, you know, this is it. Here she is. We caught her in the very act of adultery. Moses says we need to stone her. What do you say? He just ignores him and writes in the, in the sand, in the dirt. Finally, he looks up and he says, he that is without sin cast the first stone. Slowly but surely, all of them realize the whole point there. There's no such thing as someone without sin. From the oldest, it takes the older guys to get it a little quicker. You young ones, you'll get it as you grow older. <laughs> uh, they knew it, and they went away, and so did the others. When Jesus had raised up himself, he saw that there was no one there. And he said, woman, where are your accusers? Are there none? He said, none, Lord. He said, then go, sin no more, neither do I condemn you. Jesus, not afraid to be in the midst of lost, wretched sinners. He came to save folks like this. Jesus came and he related to man, but he never condoned their sin. You see, there's a way to relate to those that are sinful, but not wink at their sin, eh? It wasn't like Jesus would encourage her to continue, or, or Matthew. They, they came, when they came in contact with him, their lives were changed. Go and sin no more. It was always a foregone conclusion that he would be everything we could never be. Pay the penalty that we all deserved and obediently go to the cross. He is that perfect example. He is, as it were, the Tom Brady of quarterbacks. He is the greatest of all time when it comes to soul winners. He demonstrates the type of humility and love that, that is necessary when you're going to deliver someone out of the, the, the deepest, darkest pit. Hebrews 5, 7 and 9 says this, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned <coughs> obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obeyed him. So who is the example? Of course, it's Jesus. It's that simple Sunday school answer. Hey, who is the greatest example of a soul winner? Jesus. That's right. <laughs> right? I mean, Jesus demonstrates. He goes. He humbles himself. He goes to those that are the most lost. The whole book we've been looking here in the Acts of the Apostles is about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This risen Lord Jesus, that after he had done everything he did in laying out his life so that he might redeem a people to himself, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And what did he do? He's called us to carry out the Great Commission. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. The book of Acts opens up with him commending them to wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high, and then you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. This is all about this risen Lord Jesus. So now you say, how in the world, James, does that fit into this portion of Scripture? It fits into it very well. Because what we have in the middle of this portion of Scripture, first we have the example of the perfect soul winner. Now we have Timothy, soul winning, put into practice. Look, Keep your copy of God's Word open on your lap. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 16. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Enter young Timothy. We know young Timothy grew up in a godly home where his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice taught him the scriptures. From childhood, he knew the very scriptures 
and he was able, which were, as he was told from Paul, able to make him wise unto salvation. This is a, a fine young man, an example. I don't know if his mom and, and, and grandma had come to the Lord when Paul was first there preaching or if he'd heard the gospel since, but he came to faith. This is a great young guy. What's interesting here is he's, a Jew, he's, he's Jewish by his mother's side, but he's a Greek by his father's side. Why that's interesting is he was never circumcised, right? Our whole Jerusalem council was about circumcision. Those that say you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. But that's not an issue, right? We, we've settled that. So it doesn't matter that Timothy is not circumcised. Circumcision, just maybe some of you young kids don't know, circumcision came from the, the covenant that God made with Abraham, and the sign of that old covenant would be that you would circumcise a child before that eighth day, a boy. Um, and still today, folks are circumcised, but it's no longer, especially if you're a Christian, has anything to do with salvation. My boys were all baptized, or excuse me, all circumcised. I was circumcised. I remember they took our little boys away and brought them back. They were sleeping like they, they had never really even known what happened. But I suspect if you're circumcised when you're a bit older than eight days, it might be a bit of an issue, right? So this is where Timothy's probably kind of excited. Paul, I heard about the council. It's so great to finally meet you. Hallelujah. This, this is great. So, so we don't have to be circumcised to be saved, right? I dodged a bullet there, didn't I? I'm in good shape. Don't need to get baptized, to, to circumcised. I've been saying baptized instead of circumcised a couple times. No, no? okay, good. Don't have to be circumcised. Praise the Lord. Paul says, hey, one thing about that circumcision thing, buddy. <laughs> We're going to circumcise you. Why in the world would Timothy have to be circumcised? Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and he circumcised him. Why? Because of the Jews who were in the region. Now circumcision is not a matter of salvation. Now circumcision is a matter of voluntary humility so that he might be able to make a connection with the Jewish people, right? I'm thinking those Jewish folks are kind of hard-hearted. Paul, they've already been all after you. Tried to, they stoned you once. They thought they killed you. I think, you know what? Maybe we ought not to get circumcised. We'll just avoid preaching in the, the, the synagogues. How about we do that? That wasn't the option. Paul would continue. Remember in Romans, he said he would have, he would have preferred to be cursed so that his people might be able to be saved. And here he's bringing Timothy into this very act of humility. It's a voluntary humility so that they might be able to be soul winners. They're, they're, they're following the very footsteps of the Lord Jesus in humbling themselves. Of course, Paul was circumcised as a child. <laughs> really, it was Timothy <laughs> who was taking quite a step here that he might humble himself. I'm sure when Paul explained it to him, this is it, Timothy. We're bringing the gospel. We're bringing it, bringing it to Jews and we're bringing it to Gentiles. And we need to humble ourselves. We need to make a connection with them any way we can. This will make it so that they'll hear us. If they knew you weren't circumcised, they wouldn't even let us into our midst. So this is instructive. To be a true soul winner, we need to find a way to relate to the lost. We need to find a way to humble ourselves and make a connection so that we might bring the gospel. It's going to cost us something. Of course, they're not going to compromise when it comes to sin, but they're, they're doing all they can to bend over backwards. You know what? I think Paul explains it much better than I'm trying to explain it here. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23, this is very much what Paul had in mind. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who were under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under the law toward Christ. That I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. 
Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker of it with you. So soul winning, very clearly, is about making a connection. It's about humbling ourselves. It's about being whatever we can be so that we might have an entrance to bring the word of salvation to someone. It's about doing this, I think if, where we were a couple weeks ago, we saw that, that we need to love God with all of our heart, and if the Gentiles do, then they would want to walk in purity, right? Last week, we saw the importance of loving our neighbor, especially loving our brothers and sisters at church, right? That's wonderful. This story about soul winning is about loving our enemies. It's about loving and being with those wretched lost. I'm saved. I've been washed in the blood. I don't want to dirty myself with those wretched sinners. Paul and Timothy say that's not the way to win souls. The way to win souls is to humble ourselves, to do what we can to show compassion to those dying sinners. Jesus was truly holier than thou, and he humbled himself to minister to the lost. Is it not easier for us who know that we're wretched sinners who've been saved alone by grace? But for the grace of God, there go I. What can we do to reach outside our comfort zone to be there for those that are lost? Timothy is a living illustration that he would do anything, including his personal pain and suffering, so that he might be able to make a connection with those lost Jews. It's about love. It's about love. If Jesus was able to go and minister to a Samaritan woman who was lost in sin and had been with four or five guys and the one she was with right then was not hers, do you think maybe we could find a way to reach out to our neighbor that's been married two or three or four times? Maybe she's got three or four kids by four, three or four different guys? Oh, no, she's a wretched harlot adulterer. There's a way for us to reach out in this way, humbling ourselves. Can we reach out to our neighbor who's lost in that kind of sin? To be a soul winner, I say yes. It doesn't mean that we, 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 we somehow whitewash what they're in, but that's what the very gospel is about. It's about going to our culture, going to those that are lost, going to those that are struggling in situations just like that. We live in a culture that tells us young people don't need to get married. We live in a culture where guys and gals are living together for years. Some within our very families. We talked about the lost. Can we reach out to them? We're better than them. We're much better than them. I don't need to waste my time with them. Yeah, we do. We need to make a connection. If we're going to see our culture change, if we're going to see the family restored, we need to be soul winners. We need to, to come down off of our high horse and make friends with folks like this. And then when you're friends, you reach out to that neighbor, then you can tell them the hard stuff. This is getting you nowhere. You can't live together and expect to have God's blessing. All you're going to have is cursing. You need to turn from this sin. You need to repent. You need to stop living together. You need to trust in Christ. We need to make those connections with the world. No, I'm good. Let's just come to church on Sunday. We get to worship together, go home, and don't get our, our lives all dirty with the lost and, and, and sinners. And No, that's what the whole Acts of the Apostles is about. It's about getting out there with the gospel, touching people that are in sin and struggling, even when it's uncomfortable for us. But wait, James, we're, it, we're past that now. We live in a culture where they begin to call evil good and good evil. We now see that, that marriage has completely been, been, been warped and, and destroyed. Men with men, women with women. It's too much now time to back up. I've got a neighbor who's married to a guy, two guys. I've got another gay, a neighbor, two gals living together. K 
can we befriend these folks? Can we reach out with the power of the gospel? It's the very power of salvation for them. It was the very power of salvation for us. But our culture says no. We don't want to hear it. Keep that in the churches, your bigoted, one-sided view. Don't bring it outside the church. They even might want to come and, and, and say that you can't even preach that anymore. But you see, that's the very essence of the idea of loving our enemies. It's when we love those that are most unlovable, that are lost completely in sin. It's about the kind of love that's willing to tell them that the sin they're in is going to destroy their lives and land them in hell. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty narrow-minded, James. God's much more nuanced than that. Surely he can forgive all of those sins, right? Why would you possibly be in the face of your neighbor? Because it's love to be in the face of my neighbor, telling them, turn from your wicked ways. Jesus is able to save you. And the last part of that scripture is very instructive because, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. If we've been delivered from such sins, are we going to set up in our houses, in our churches, and, and be so thankful that we're forgiven? Let the world go to H-E double hockey sticks in a handbasket. I'm good. That's what Timothy is teaching us here. That's what Paul is teaching us here. We need to get outside our comfort zone. We need to do what it takes to reach out to folks that are in these very horrible sins. Very sins that God delivered some of us from. So now, you know, Jesus came and he was holier than thou. We, we come and we're holy and forgiven because of Christ. We've got a point of reference. We've avoided destruction in our lives. We've avoided the fires of hell. God's given us great hope. We need to be the ones to carry this out to the world. Tom Schreiner says this about this particular scripture in 1 Corinthians 9 about this uh, being all things to all people. Believers have rights, but those rights are always to be exercised in love so that Christians for the benefit and salvation of others. Believers have rights, but those rights are always to be exercised in love so that Christians live for the benefit and salvation of others. The pattern of a believer's life is to be cruciform which means sacrificing one's preferred way of life for the benefit and good of others. Okay, Paul, I'll be circumcised. Let's do it. Let's get the very best in oil. Let's, let's do this right. But, but I'm willing, Timothy would say, to do whatever it takes to save those of my own, uh, of, 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 of our area. His mom was Jewish, so, so maybe some of his very family were be the ones that he would preach the gospel to. John Stott says it this way, his new community is to be organized on a different principle and according to a different model, humble service, not oppressive power. Leadership and lordship are two distinct concepts. The symbol of an authentically Christian leadership is not the purple robe of an emperor, but the coarse apron of a slave not a throne of ivory and gold, but a basin of water for washing people's feet. We are the very means by which God will transform the world. We have the message of reconciliation. We now all have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Are we going to be Timothy's? Are we going to go? 
Are we going to be like Jesus and humble ourselves and give of ourselves? We need to be. We need to see that Jesus is our example. Timothy puts this to practice and demonstrates it well. But ultimately, what's the goal of winning souls? So we can get people in church, right? So that we're going to need to build bigger parking lots. That's what it's about. Of course not. It's about folks being won into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, the risen Lord Jesus. Acts 16.5 says this, So the churches were strengthened in faith and increased in number daily. I wonder how wonderful it was when Timothy was able to be with Paul in a synagogue, preaching the gospel, and some of these very Jews that let him in because he was circumcised came to faith. All over the, the, the first century world, the gospel is bearing fruit. People are coming out of darkness into light. The very light of the gospel that, that Jesus said, they were the light of the world. Wait, wait, no, Jesus is the light of the world. No, he told them that this message now that they preached was the light to draw people out of darkness. If we follow Jesus' example, and if we follow the example of Paul and Timothy, we can see the results they saw. The goal of soul winning is winning souls, seeing people's lives changed. All authority has been given to Jesus, and we are commanded to preach the gospel to all nations and to teach them to obey all that Jesus is sending. It's always and ever an encouraging prospect. The very worst of the worst cases, Jesus changes. Changed my heart. If you had known me when I was 18 and before, you would have never imagined that God could change me the way he has. Amen. There's no one that's a lost cause for the gospel. Right. We're called to be soul winners. Soul winning is not this thing where you get all puffed up and go, listen, here's the message. Believe it or else. It's a work of humble people. It's a work where we bring ourselves down to the level of those who are lost and dying. And it's going to bear fruit. It's the way that we can see our towns change, our cities change, our state change, our country change from darkness to light. Oh, no. Uh, it's, it's too much now. It, it's over. Well, listen to John Stott, what he says. I, I'm with John Stott. The church tends to become very preoccupied with its own affairs, obsessed with petty uh, parochial trivia, while the needy world outside is waiting. So the Son sends us out into the world as the Father had sent him into the world. Mission arises from the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus. His birth, by which he identified himself with our humanity, calls us to a similar costly identification with people. His death reminds us that suffering is the key to church growth, since it is the seed that dies which multiplies. And his resurrection gave him the universal lordship and enabled him both to claim that all authority was now his and to send his church to disciple the nations. Send his church to disciple the nations. Now, some of us go to long, faraway lands like Ryan and Anna. We pray for our missionaries. God bless them. They're wonderful. But you know what? All of us right here are living in the midst of a mission field. There are souls that need to be won. Who's going to tell them? We have to. Let's not stay shut up in our churches. Let's not only declare the glory of God and his gospel on Sunday, but let's take it to the streets. It's hard work engaging our culture with the gospel, but the results are guaranteed. What we need to do is be faithful, faithful to bring that message and that gospel to a lost and dying world. People are sick, and the prognosis is dire. But we have the antidote. Someone got the gumption up to tell you or I that Jesus died for us, that we're sinners, 
that we have the ability through faith in Christ to not live that way. The power of God unto salvation is this gospel. Repent for the kingdom of God is hand, at hand. Jesus would put it this way in Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's hard work. It's a lot easier to persecute those that persecute us. To hate those who hate us. Right? But Jesus calls us to a much higher way. If we're going to be sons of our Father who is in heaven, we're going to do what he very well demonstrated this to us. <clears throat> the reason we do it is that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, Jesus says, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do the same? Therefore, you shall be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What's that perfection of our Father? The perfection of our Father is that he so loved this despicable and disastrous and dying, debaucherous world that he sent his own dear son to save them. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. God can die for his enemies. God can send his son to die for his enemies. But we can't get ourselves off, off our lazy boy and go next door to our sinning neighbors that might hate on us just tell them, hey, how you doing? How about we have dinner, right? Did you know that, that Jesus died to save sinners like you and me? Well, we don't have to come right up with that first thing and say, hey, listen, I see you're living with your girlfriend. You might want to break that off right now. Get your head straight, right? We need to say that in a loving, generous way at some point. But can we befriend them? Can we? Can we be good neighbors to our enemies? Can we love our enemies? I submit that we can. I submit that we're commanded to. And I submit that we're guaranteed that there's going to be fruit. We're Calvinists, aren't we? Right? God has preordained and foreknown all that will come to him. I just would like to be one of the blessed that can actually bring that news. He'll save folks one way or another. Let's be part of that. Let's be soul winners. John Stott again. The glory of loving and serving our enemies, however, is that we thereby decrease the amount of evil in the world. The glory of loving and serving our enemies, however, is that we thereby decrease the amount of evil in the world. The supreme example is the cross. Christ's willingness to bear the scorn of men and the wrath of God has brought salvation to just a couple, one or two here or there. Millions and millions of people have come through the power of the cross. The cross is the only alchemy that turns evil into good. Jesus waits until his enemies be made their, his footstool. Be a lot nicer if they're made his footstool through us preaching the gospel and they bow the knee to Jesus now. That's right. <laughs> is that not good? We can be those soul winners. We can be those that, that preach the gospel. It's going to mean uncompromisingly telling people to turn from their wicked ways and trust in Christ. And we're going to see as we work our way through the Acts of the Apostles that Timothy and Paul are in danger all over. Silas, all of them. Uh, they're going to preach the gospel, especially to these Jews, and it's not going to go well. But they didn't stop preaching, as is Paul's custom. He would go into the synagogue and preach the gospel. In conclusion, I'd like to challenge all of us not to shrink back from the task that God has placed before us. We are the light of the world. 
Paul made it clear in Acts 13, 47, For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. It's right there in black and white. You all believe your Bibles? Are we called into that same work? No, that's just Paul and those first century guys, that gospel stuff. Of course not. We still are the means by which folks are saved. Where? To the ends of the earth. To Bath, to Hornell, to Geneseo, to Dansville, wherever you live. West Bloomfield, right? Ted? No. Where are you guys? Yeah. They, they preach the gospel over there in Penyan? People come to the Lord? <laughs> everywhere, everywhere we live, we're called to preach the gospel. Jesus, again, I, I want to go back over the Sermon on the Mount again. It's such great stuff. Jesus makes it very clear in Matthew 15, 13 to 16, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. May we once again, as the church, be salt in our world. May we be that by which God can preserve and bring back a people to himself. Mm -hmm. It's the only way where folks turn from sin to obeying God. Darkness to light. Millions. Jesus would go on to say, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The gospel. What was Timothy doing there, getting circumcised? Humbling himself so that he might have an audience with the Jews. What are we doing to humble ourselves so that we might have an audience with our neighbors? We're called to that type of soul winning. We're called to follow in the footsteps of our precious Lord and Savior. We're called to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. He's kind, he's loving, he's long-suffering. He made a way. We're called to be that very light to our world. Let's come up and, and sing our last song here together, if we would. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy. We thank you, God, that you've made a way for us to be made right with you. We thank you, Lord, that, that you came, you humbled yourself, you took upon yourself the form of a man. You were everything we are as man, yet without sin. But you still went to that cross so that you might save us. Lord, may we in the light of this truth humble ourselves. Do what it takes, Lord, to share the gospel with our neighbors, with our enemies, those that hate us. You're able to change them from your enemies to your children, from our enemies to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Help us, Lord, to have a vision for that type of humility and service to our enemies that we might preach the gospel. We pray, God, that you might help us. We recognize this is a difficult task. In and of ourselves, Lord, we are completely incapable. We pray, Lord, that you might fill us afresh by your Holy Spirit, that we might truly be witnesses and testify to you and your goodness and your gospel, Lord. Father, we pray for revival. We pray that you might bring revival in our area, in our state, in our country, Lord, in this world, God, that is 
set against you, that you might bring many to bow the knee, to turn from their sins and to trust in you. And Lord, we pray that you might use us to be vessels for this work. Help us, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.